Welcome to the Illinois Perinatal Quality Collaborative Labor Management Support eModules. These eModules were made as a resource to support hospital implementation of the ILPQC Promoting Vaginal Birth or PVB initiative. The aim of the PVB initiative is for 70% of Illinois hospitals to be at or below the Healthy People 2030 goal of 23.6% cesarean delivery rate among NTSV or nulliparous term singleton and vertex births by December 31st, 2022. Our goals include increasing the percent of C-sections among NTSV births that meet ACOG SMFM criteria for cesarean, as well as educating physicians, midwives, and nurses on ACOG and SMFM criteria for cesarean, including labor management strategies. Hospital quality improvement teams participating in the PVB initiative are working on five key strategies to reduce cesareans among NTSV births, including labor management support. ILPQC partnered with Jessica Brumley, the co-creator of the Florida Perinatal Quality Collaborative, or FPQC, labor support workshops, completed by over 400 nurses and providers in Florida as part of FPQC's Promoting Primary Vaginal Deliveries, or PROVIDE initiative. Jessica is Director of Midwifery at the University of South Florida Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, where she leads a team of 14 midwives and advanced practice nurses. She also serves as an advisor on the FPQC Provide Initiative. In August and September of 2021, Jessica and ILPQC worked together to offer two live virtual labor management support courses for nurses and providers in Illinois. These sessions were recorded and broken down by topic into this collection of 14 e-modules ranging from 6 to 21 minutes each. We are excited to share them with you. Now I will turn it over to Jessica. So there's the hormonal physiology part of it. Then there's also kind of the, the structural um, part of it as well. Uh, and I'm not gonna go through all of these, but I just kind of bring up the cardinal movements of labor to say that the fetus isn't descending into some tube, you know, like the pelvis is not just some um, tube that the baby just kind of shoots down. Um, there's, there, there are actually um, a lot of different um, twists and turns that are happening um, during labor uh, and, um, and our position can influence the path of the baby. And so um, I thought this is you know, a good picture of you know, the pelvis and how fetal rotation can be impacted by um, the, um, the position of the mom, right? That can influence um, how the pelvis opens up um, in order to allow the baby to navigate the birth canal. And so we know that epidurals can have um, pros and, and cons. Um, so once a patient is epiduralized, um, she doesn't feel the urge or, or the desire to move around on her own. And, um, and so how, how do we rotate and open up the pelvis? How do we optimize the baby descending? Um, how does this intervention affect labor hormones? Um, we know that epidurals can lead to increased Pitocin usage and the prolonged stages of labor and increased operative deliveries. Um, this is um, um, a study um, that was part of the Listening to Mothers 3 um, survey. And, um, and uh, in, in this um, group of 750 first time mothers uh, with um, term births who experienced labor, they broke down um, the group into those that needed an induction and those that didn't. Um, and then in, in each of those groups, those that received an epidural and those that did not, and then the this, this, um, cesarean section rates. And so you can see that those who had an induction and an epidural um, had a 31% cesarean rate, 
and those that had spontaneous labor and no epidural had a 5% cesarean rate. Now, we can't take this data to say that, um, that it's causative, right? I'm not saying that you know epidurals cause this or the induction um, caused that. Um, it is um, definitely possible um, that there were problems along the way that necessitated the induction and, um, and that made the labor more painful. Um, but there's certainly right, some kind of association there that um, we need to pay attention to. Uh, and uh, in, in that committee opinion on approaches to limit intervention during labor and birth, they talk about the important, importance of avoiding pharmacologic analgesia or epidural anesthesia um, and, and um, how that will vary based on the individual patient's values and the medical circumstances. Um, but it is important that um, we have all of the options available for our patients. Um, so by no means am I um, using this as a platform to say that um, patients shouldn't be getting epidurals because I feel really strongly that um, patients should have every, you know, everything that, is, um, that, that they feel that they need. Um, and so um, you know, pain management should be provided when, whenever medically indicated. Um, but I do think it's important for us to consider um, how we're caring for patients with an epidural. Um, and, and having conversations with them about the risks versus the benefits. Um, and so I recommend to my patients that they wait until true active labor before getting an epidural um, and that they optimize all of the different comfort techniques available um, until they get into active labor. Um, and I have a conversation with them about why and what are the risks versus the benefits and, and but also let them know right up front that they're the ones who get to make that decision, not me. Um, and if, you know, if we've done everything and they're two centimeters and being induced and they feel like they really need an epidural, that that's their call. Um, but I want to make sure that they're fully informed. And once they do have uh, an epidural, then um, it's important that um, we work with them to change position um, frequently. Um, and this, this is a nice handout from Penny Simpkin. Um, and she, she has so many um, great resources. Um, and this is on safe positions for the mother with an epidural. Um, we have these actually laminated in, um, in our labor rooms as you know, a tool that we can use to show our patients um, how we'll be repositioning them uh, you know, throughout, um, throughout labor. Um, and so we've talked about uh, the our normal physiology and um, and how interventions can um, you know disrupt kind of um, you know our, our hormonal state status um, and and these interventions often lead to other interventions that we need to use um, to monitor prevent or, or treat um, the side effects and and um, you know I had a patient one time who said you know like is this normal and I was like. Oh yeah, right, absolutely. You know, you got an epidural, you got an IV, you know, you have the monitors, you have a Foley catheter, you got an IUPC in or whatever, just, you know, it just, just kind of, you know, this is, this is all, this all can be a, a normal um, part, but this escalation of technology can further disrupt hormonal physiology and, and it, it can introduce some extra risks to mother and baby. So I, I like this, um, you know, this visual, it's the cascade of interventions. And it can start with really one seemingly benign thing like stationary position, right? Or continuous fetal monitoring for a low risk laboring person, which leads to stationary positioning, which then leads to more painful contractions, which then, makes them feel like they need an epidural and then they have weaker contractions or a longer labor. So then we do a ROM and PIT and then maybe there's some fetal heart rate concerns or a fever or an infection. And then you have those increased risk of operative vaginal delivery, C-section um, or postpartum um, complications. And so we've all seen this, you know, just kind of like spirals out, you know, from, from one to the next. So, Interventions used appropriately can be life-saving, um, but routine use without a valid indication can transform childbirth from a normal physiologic process and family life event into a medical or surgical procedure. 
And every intervention presents the possibility of untoward effects and additional risks that engender the need for more interventions with their own inherent risks. Um, unintended consequences to intrapartum interventions um, make it imperative that um, nurse educators work with other professionals to promote natural childbirth processes and advocate for policies that focus on ensuring informed consent and alternative choices. All about options and what we can do to um, promote all the possible options for our patients as, as possible. Because really, we don't wanna do any harm, right? We, we want to avoid um, this, this idea of iatrogenesis or, or harm that originates from you know, the healer. Um, we you know we um, want to avoid this um, you know at all at all costs. Uh, so you know a couple things that ACOG has has talked about as far as things to avoid, right? Um, things such as routine amniotomy, continuous electronic fetal heart rate monitoring has not improved outcomes when used for women with low risk pregnancies. Um, women in spontaneously progressing labor may not root, um, routinely need continuous infusion of IV fluids. Um, they talk about no one position needing to be mandated nor prescribed. Um, you know, this is like, this, this is all like at the heart of midwifery. So this, this all really spoke to me when, you know, when, when I read it. Um, and, and these are things that, you know, we try and implement at our institution. So women have the innate capacity to give birth and they remember their birth experiences for their entire lives. We, we have an, an honor and an opportunity to be part of that. Uh, anyone who's been doing this long enough has probably been walking somewhere and had someone tell them, oh my God, you were my labor nurse or you were my midwife or you were my doctor. Uh, and, and you don't remember them. And you're like, oh, how's the baby? And, and they go, starting kindergarten this year, you know, like six years later or something, and, and they remember your face, um, and maybe you only met them that, you know, that one time, um, you know, or ask your, your grandparents, you know, your grandmothers about their birth experience, and I guarantee you that they can remember a, a level of detail that they can't remember on, on many other things. Childbirth uh, is commonly treated as an illness in the U.S., and it's gradually become more and more intervention intensive. And these practices are influenced by cultural beliefs about health risks, the impact of technological advances, our obstetric training, and, and fear of litigation. So, you know, we don't practice in a, you know, in a vacuum. But routine intervention intensive birth exposes women to avoidable harm, it increases costs of maternity health care. And it doesn't provide benefits to women who don't need intervention. Um.